welcome everybody. Today we're back with a new angle on working with China. We've got three successful projects that reveal the secrets of working with Chinese partners so that we can develop content that works both in the East as well as in the West. I'm Sarah Baines from the Creative Garden, and I'm joined today by Colin Williams, Creative Director of Sixteen South, uh, Alan Plenderleith, award-winning writer and currently head writer on Dear Squad, Tony Reed, BBC Children's genre lead, BBC Children's animation and puppetry. They're going to be taking us through case studies where they've been working with China. I'm also joined by Alicia Liu, founder and managing director at Singing Grass, who's here to give us an insight into storytelling from a Chinese perspective, um, and particular one with an angle on publishing, not just TV. So we're delighted to have such a breath, breadth of experience here. We've all been working under different constraints and very difficult ones for the last 18 months. And so these case studies have an extra resonance in what has been possible. I want to give you a little bit of landscape before we start, some of which you'll know and some of which might be new. First point, China has 1.4 billion people. That's billion people. CCTV is the main channel there. And there are, are streamers there, the two of which are Tencent and Aichi, and they're two of the most important, particularly in the kids' field. We're going to be looking at some of their projects today. I'm going to leave you to do the maths on what the numbers might be for Aichi and Tencent, as they're two of the main ones, and that's out of 1.4 billion people. Their reach is enormous. Um, in China, Unlike the UK, it's possible to be on multiple platforms at the same time. And subscriptions to the platforms are low. So Chinese children often have the ability to access a much larger library of and texture of different types of stories than, than we might assume or we have here. For the people that we have here today, being with those bigger players and being there in that landscape is huge in terms of brand awareness. As I say, see the maths that I, I, I gave you above. So I'd like to pass on now very swiftly to Alicia. And Alicia, you're going to be um, helping us by taking us through much more of the story landscape and what's happening. Alicia. Thank you, Sarah. It's great to be here. I feel really pri privileged. Um, at Singing Grass, we do work with clients actually in both camps, both in the UK and in China. I work a lot in publishing, um, mainly advising international publishers looking to expand their outreach in China. And increasingly, we're working with Chinese publishing and media groups on their international partnerships. Also, I now personally live in the UK and, and actually, in fact, my, my son was, was born here in London. But growing up in China and now actively working with partners in China, I think gives me a really strong sense of what they really want from a Chinese perspective. I think there are slight nuances when you work you know, between UK and China. One is in terms of working partnerships. When you, Sarah, like you said, you know, in China, you need to work to know who are the big players. But when you work with the big players, the decision-making structure in China is very different from the West. Um, and secondly, what content does the market really want to see in China? From my experience, for early years, um, pre, we're talking about preschool in Chinese sense. So Chinese children start school at, at six years old. I think the two cultures in the, the, this area are not so different. And Western preschool brands are finding a lot of success in China, you know, from the classic Peppa Pig, Thomas the Tank Engine, to the recent Hey Daggy Paw Patrol. And then actually, in fact, 53% of picture books in China are written by international authors. But then as Chinese children grow older, there is a real culture gap. Many Chinese children's stories don't work so well for Western audience. And I think many Western children's stories don't work so well for Chinese publishers and audience either. So I'm sure we'll find out more at the three case studies today. Thank you very much, Alicia. And I'm sure you, you and I will both be learning a lot. And to start that process off, I'd like to uh, 
bring on Colin from 16 South um, to take us through the project you've been working on. Colin, do you want to tell us more about Coop Troop and uh, your journey so far? I suppose for us it's, it's special, every show is special, but this one this one's special because it's our first show which actually isn't preschool. So it's um, six to nine. Um, it's commonly driven and it's also our very first uh, uh, super high-end CGI show as well. Um, so we're doing, you know, making lots of changes, doing lots of things for the, for the first time, and we're we're delighted that um, the show is a is a ten cent original. Um, you, you know, Sarah mentioned, you mentioned Sarah so, some of the extraordinary numbers in terms of viewers. Um, I think it's hard, to, it's it's hard to hard to hard to remember sometimes just how big a country China is and how big the audience is as well. And so so for us to have um, an audience on ten on ten cent kids is just incredible. Um, so so the journey, yeah, the journey, the, the journey to the coop trip. We came up. We wanted to create a show. I suppose we were looking at you know way back when when we were making Claude for for Disney Junior. Um, myself and my friend um, Alex T Smith were were thinking how can we do what Paw Patrol is doing for for preschoolers? How can we do that for older kids? And actually, you know, create something which has real universal comedy, um, which makes parents laugh as, as much as, as kids. And we started to think about things that we loved ourselves. And and the one show which 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 kept coming to mind was the A Team, you know, back from the seventies and the eighties. And this bunch of, as we'd say here in Northern Ireland, a bunch of idiots, you know, trying trying to trying to sort you know solve solve problems and and actually sometimes making them worse. And that was really the the the. You know what? What that's really kind of what's at the heart of the coop trip. Um, we we've described it to some people as imagine the A A team only with a bunch of farm animals. Well, it's a it's a lot more than that. But but it it, it actually I mean it it actually is you know it's a it's a it's a bunch of four animals and an egg who happen to live on a farm whose job it is. Um, well, actually, their their problem is that they're bored. They're absolutely bored, stupid, and they're tired of the the chomp chomp poop of. Of, of the daily routine of a farm animal and they want adventure. They want to get off the farm into the nearby town and help any any animal with a problem. And those animals happen to be happen to be pets in the nearby town of Animaville. Um and Animaville is is a is a lovely little um a lot what what looks and feels a little bit like a French town. You know, it's it's quaint, it's it's lovely. All the owners just happen to be always out at work, so we never really see humans, but humans are always a threat. And their pampered pets um will ring the coop trip with, with any kind of any shape or form of issue or worry. And of course they they're general. They're always generally ringing the coop trip with, with a with a silly a silly thing which needs fixed, and the coop trip are on the ball to to address it. The coop trip always make things worse before they make things better. But the journey the journey from idea to to green light I suppose really came probably a couple of years ago at uh, MIP TV. Um, I know you were there, Sarah. I was there on the stage with you, <laughs> and it was one of those. People were saying, "Oh, MIP TV is a waste of time. Don't go. No one ever goes." Well, we went and we got a show greenlit. So, <laughs> um, it, it, I shouldn't say that because now next year everyone will be there on MIP TV and we won't have a chance to see anybody. Um, but it was a really, it was we, we took part in in a in a, a, a pe- it was like a pitch off almost, um, and we we showed it for the first time. We showed it really, you know, on stage to a bunch of broadcasters, um, and it was actually there that we. We we got engaged with uh, France Television, who who loved it. It was what they were looking for at the time. We got on really well with them as people, and they we began a conversation about a a co development. So, sorry, a, a, about, about putting it into the development convention, which is France's France France French French TV's um, development process. Um, and at the same time, we also, you know, we were chatting to Ching, who we know very well um, and have have known for for years actually. And we were um, we showed it to Ching, and she she told us that actually it's exactly what they're looking for for the Chinese market. So we thought, wow, we've got these two incredible partners. You know, could could we possibly get France Television to say yes? And they did eventually, um, and Tencent to say yes, and they did. Um, and all of a sudden, we've got two 
two great partners um to make you know to 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 literally be the parents um of of this show do you think it's worth us having a quick look at the the video that brought ching in before we talk about what it is that you think really works for a chinese audience what kind of question is that of course it's worth watching it <laughs> <laughs> an unlikely bunch of heroes escaped from their dreary life their mission to help any animal with a problem yes <laughs> we're on our way maggie look out mcdo all round uh, action bunny Journey, Spanners, O'Cluck, the best driver in town. Joe Lezer, master of disguise. Hard to crack. Oh. Ah! Drive the muscle, strength, determination, uh, focus. The kid who superhero in training. If you're in trouble, then you need the country. What a load of trot. Can I get paid now, please? I was there on the day you showed it and it, it made the audience come alive. What do you think at that point, which was two years ago, worked particularly well for the for the Chinese market. What do you think Ching, who's who's heads up the international side of um Tencent on the production side, what do you think she saw that made it a, a, a green light for her? So it's funny, you know, we're based in Northern Ireland, you know, we're English speakers, you know, and here we are with two partners, you know, and and actually neither you know, English being neither of their of their first language, so making it in French for a French audience and, and in Mandarin for a Chinese audience. So, so why would they why would they pick up a show which was an English you know English created English written and English animated sh- show? And to be honest, the it's 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 not so hard to, to kind of comprehend because the universal language which we believe across the world and every kid. Um, who you know gets it is comedy, um, it was a, it was written as a comedy series, um, and as a, as a silly and daft comedy show first and foremost. Yes, there are, there are you know there is a heart to show, and there are there are you know messages which run through it in terms of look everyone can be a superhero, and superheroes are not necessarily what they might be portrayed as in terms of what you think a superhero is, and actually everyone can be a superhero. But and but really the the very you know at the very core of this show it's comedy and I think good comedy you know and it's classic comedy as well classic comedy works works all over the world um and it's the one like it's the one language that we all speak and just to just sum up what do you think you've learned in the process from when you did that um teaser which was you going in there going we've got this idea we're going to play with it and start off all on our own working with you know, France Television but for this um, video particularly Ching and her team and where what's the process how was it working with with Tencent and where are you now the process has been I mean, I mean I think a lot of producers think oh China's so far away oh culturally maybe so far away uh, that's 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 absolutely not that has not been our experience whatsoever. Um, they've been a great partner, probably one of the best partners we've ever had on 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 any show. Um, we I mean when I say it's been a mutually respectful partnership, it really really has been. They they trust us to make the show, and we we trust them to 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 be a great a great platform. Um, they've been really really supportive. Um, they they. It was the easiest negotiation and the easiest deal to do because it, it felt like it was what they were looking for and, and we were also looking for a great audience. Um, the time difference is certainly not as painful as 
Australia <laughs> or Los Angeles, um, you know, if you co-produce with anybody, and we've always co-produced, you always have to make concessions, whether that means moving your time of day a little bit um, or or whatever. Um, but the, the, we find the team at, you know, Ching and our team at Tencent, they're, they're really, they're smart people. They know what they want. Um, and it, it has been not, it's been, it's, it's been a joy so far. Where are we at the moment? We are, we've been writing. I think we're almost two thirds of the way through writing. Um, there are 11 minute stories, so 52 of them. And we are beginning the process of animation. Um, I should have mentioned our, our co-production, um, our co-production partners are Micross in, in Paris. Um, and we are, as you'll see in some of the slides, you know, on the screen at the moment, we've, we've, we've been working through um, artwork in terms of conceptual artwork, you know, finished conceptual artwork, and now moving on to modeling, character modeling and world modeling. So we're, we really have, you know, it's it's a big budget show. It's our biggest budget show we've ever, ever made as well. Um, and we want to put all of that money on screen so that it looks and feels Pixar quality. That's fantastic. There's so many more questions and I'm sure Alicia and I will have questions later on, not only here, but also, um, there's loads I'd like to ask you, but thank you very much for the for the meantime. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on because we're so uh, tight for time. There's so much rich content to Alan. Alan, you've got a different project, um, which is Dear Squad. Do you want to talk more from a writing perspective about how it was working with, I think, Nickelodeon and Aichi, which is another streamer? and what you've learnt from it. Um, yeah, it's been really fascinating. We're on Series 3 now of Deer Squad, and, um, you know, from the very beginning, um, this was always going to be a show for, uh, you know, a worldwide audience, uh, not specifically uh, Western or Eastern or, um, you know, no, no specific target audience. Um, but the actual, you know, the essence of it is that sort of universal uh at storytelling, which is, you know, um, something that Colin was touched on there about comedy, you know, we like to use visual comedy, uh, 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 you know, as opposed to sort of puns and wordplay and that kind of thing, um, you know, and universal story themes that children, you know, all over the world will relate to, uh, you know, relatable problems, uh, you know, friendships, jealousy, you know, learning new things, failing and so on and succeeding. Um, and so in terms of storytelling, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much, uh, you know, kids all over the world have the same uh, challenges and the same hopes and dreams, uh, you know. Uh, you know, it's, it's a sort of universal um, truth, really. So we try to touch on those when we're telling stories in Deer Squad and, you know, come up with stories which you know, work wherever you are. And were you taking things from different cultures and mixing them through into the story so that it worked for both cultures but also represented things in different cultures? Yeah, I mean, um, it's trying to um, create a world which, you know, uh, kids from anywhere can relate to. Um, and using parts of certain cultures, uh, for instance, you know, the very... Uh, DNA of Deer Squad is is based on Chinese culture. Uh, it's it's all based on the Chinese zodiac uh, and the five elements of the Chinese zodiac. So the four deer, for instance, have planet power, uh, which is you know wood and uh, fire, and uh, well, in our case it's sun because it's preschool, um, and earth and water, uh, and the fifth element is metal, and that's represented by the antagonist. Of the of the story, which is Sir Steel, uh, and so it's these five elements which really come together, and we've used the uh, some of the animals in the Chinese zodiac for the vehicles, for instance. You know, we've got you know rabbit and an ox and so on and a stallion, um, and so it's it's in there. You know, the DNA of the show is based on on all that very traditional Chinese culture, um, but it's not a sort of um, it's not on the surface, if you like. You know, it's a show which, you know, has universal themes and should work worldwide. 
And in terms of of what you learned apart from all the signs of the zodiac and how to get them into deer squad so that kids kids can can see them what else did you learn around the creative and writing process was was there a, a difference working with the group of people that you you worked with well actually um it's been very easy um you know you would think there would be uh, huge cultural differences uh, in terms of you know tone of voice sense of humor and so on but there, it's been extremely easy. You know, we've all uh, agreed on what we want. We've all agreed on the tone of the show. Uh, I mean, it's it's the UK, Nick International, it's Nick Asia, and it's I Chi China uh, working together. And it's been incredibly easy. We're on series three now, and it's very smooth. You know, we've got a good team of writers, and uh, we all seem to have the same sense of humour, which helps. <laughs> So, so your your uh, your story meetings are, are good fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, really good fun, and I, I'm surprised sometimes, you know, because I've got quite a kind of wacky sense of humour, uh, and I, you know, I love that kind of stuff because I think kids love that kind of stuff, um, and it and it seems to work for everybody on the show. Yeah. In a minute, we're going to see a clip, but be, be, before we do, just what do you think it is when? you're bringing that group of people together and it can work so well and it can not work so well and I'm sure you've worked on projects that haven't worked quite as smoothly what do you think the essential ingredients are to get that flow oh, I think that's easy it's trust basically you know it's um you know it's trusting the people that are involved you know when 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 someone has an opinion it's a strong opinion then uh, you know trusting that opinion and it goes you know, both ways, uh, you know, I Chi are fantastic with their notes, uh, you know, and Nickelodeon, trust the writers, you know, everybody sort of trusts each other. We've all been hired to do kind of what we're good at, really. So um, so everybody uh, listens to everybody else. And, and it's fascinating sometimes, you know, listening to um, the notes from China, you know, particular uh, points that you think, OK, you wouldn't have thought of that. Um, but on the whole, um, it's it's actually quite seamless. I mean, I'd like to come up with loads of, you know, problems that we've had, but there haven't been any. It's been incredibly uh, simple. So um, that's nice. I think that's what people need want to and need to hear, that it doesn't have to be complex, but it's around that trust and integrity that comes together, whether you're miles apart, you know, in the middle of a, a period where nobody can travel and everything's on Zoom, or whether you're sitting in a room together, it's uh, it's collaboration. Before we, we leave you, Alan, it would be lovely if we could take a quick look at a clip. If the city needs them today, Dear Squad will be on their way. Doing just what heroes should to save the day with Water, Shine, Air, Play, Planet, Power, Fight for Good. Dear Squad, Friendship's Calling. Dear Squad, Heroes in Training. Dear Squad, Straight to the Rescue. Planet Power, Save the Day. So once again, thank you, Alan. There's so much more we could we could talk about. And hopefully at some point people will get a chance to, to get a deeper dive into Deer Squad, both by watching it and talking to you. So next, Tony Reid from the BBC. Tony, you're going to be talking to us about two projects you've been working on. Um, we've got Love Monster, which is with Yu Young, which is a well-known production company. And then uh, Super Tato with, uh, once again, Tencent. Do you want to give us a snapshot of each to start with? Yes, yes, absolutely. Hello, Sarah. Hi, hello, everyone. Uh, yes, so, um, yeah, Love Monster, we are um, currently working on series three of that. Um, coming towards the end of it, actually, uh, the end of that series with a, a double episode ready for Christmas and then some new episodes into the, into the new year. Um, and then Soup Potato um, is a, a brand new series that's just been uh, just commissioned uh, late last year actually, but just released a couple of weeks ago in the press release a couple of weeks ago. Um, and as the name suggests, Soup Potato is a hero spud who lives in the supermarket and protects his uh, fruit and veggie friends from the dastardly plans of an evil pea. Um, and we're literally just starting on 52 episodes of that show. Um, and both both shows are co-productions, as you say. Um, Love Monster is a co-production with Boat Rocker and Ooyoung. 
and Super Potato is a co-production with BBC Studios and Tencent. Uh, both the same duration, they're both seven minutes, uh, they're both based on a book series uh, and both are preschool. Um, I, I guess Super Potato is probably slightly upper, upper preschool, I think we'd call it. Um, but they are slightly different models. Um, with Love Monster, we work with Ooh Young as a co production partner as well as an animation service provider uh, for, their, for their portion of the work, for the, the Chinese portion of the work. Um, the other um, portion of the work uh, for, for Love Monster is uh, supplied by Carrot and A Productions in the UK. And then um, for Super Potato, um, the work is, uh, we work with Tencent as a, as a co-production partner, but then we are um, seeking at the moment an independent animation service provider for uh, a portion of the work in China uh, and with the UK work coming from um, our partners at Blue Zoo and Plugin. Um, so yeah, so, so in, in addition to uh, animation, uh, some scripts uh, for both projects are written by Chinese writers. Um, for Love Monster we had a, a portion of the storyboards um, uh, in, in China and about two thirds of the backgrounds and then for Super Potato we're planning to have a third of the animation in our, uh, the company we land on in China. Um, so, so I think as, as with any um, co-production um, with international partners, both projects are, are real creative collaboration, um, which includes work, as I said, being split between the, the territories. Uh, but that's, that's work that always benefits the parties, you know, things like local content agreements, um, uh, the relationships, and, and of course, the, the audience. Um, and, and even though it's early days on Super Tato, we've been working with Tencent uh, all through development and we've got to know our creative partners really well. And, and just to echo uh, Colin's point, you know, they're, they're, they are a real joy to work with. Um, as are as our Yu Yang, you know, we, with both partners, um, they are completely editorially and creatively aligned. Um, we, don't, we don't notice um, huge cultural differences. Um, so really to, to echo some of the points made by both Alan and, and, and Colin. Um, and it's, it's just really wonderful to have their input and perspective across the series and I think that really helps us to, to tell exciting and unique stories that, um, that work for everyone, um, the stories, but, but they're stories that we wouldn't have had without those partnerships. Um, and so I think, I think a, a good example of this one, of this, is um, a Love Monster episode uh, which is uh, about the uh, Love Monster making mooncakes for his friends and this was written by one of our Chinese writers, um, Ellen Z, uh, and was inspired by a Chinese festival. So we, we have a clip of that, I believe. Ah, that's our friend Love Monster and he plans to make something big for Mooncake Day. Over the moon to announce tonight's big finale will take place at Love Monster's house. Yeah! Where we can all watch the moon rise. I'm gonna make an enormous, record breaking strawberry mooncake for everyone! Yeah! Let the festivities begin! Thank you so much, Tony. Both. Tencent and IGE, the quality of the executives there is amazing. You know, we've talked about how easy it is, but when I've talked to them, they really understand the deeper editorial rather than just the surface. They understand character, they understand story. Could you take us through a bit more around the creative approach and pitch and what you've learned from working with them and, and how you're going to move on from that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, it's uh, Super Potato is slightly different to Love Monster in, in that we co-developed the series um, with BBC Studios and Tencent. Um, so, the partners were involved um, from a very early stage. With, with Love Monster, we, we developed it in, in-house with Boat Rocker and then and pit, then uh, took it to, to Young. But, but with Super Potato, we've been forging that new relationship right from the beginning. And of course, that, that's a really positive thing. It, it, it makes that transition into production uh, much smoother because they know the project and as you say they they're already on board they know the characters they know the type of stories that we've collectively decided that we we want to tell um and i think uh, you know it's um uh, it's been uh what i find is that there's actually if we get our bit of the work right from from that development process that's happened then actually the the comments that come back from Tencent are, are fairly light as I say we, we're, we're pretty well aligned um, with them editorially and, and I think that's that's partly because we've 
been working with them right through development, partly because, as, as you say, they, they have a deep understanding of storytelling and understanding of storytelling and, and character. Uh, but also, we have a, a we've forged a very strong relationship already as we, as we go into production, and, and that's that makes for a smoother way, I think. And, th- and is there anything in particular you've learnt from the process? I think the um, I think any any international co-production it's fair to say that there's that there can be there can be challenges but and I think the the unique challenges um, that we found on, on both these projects is is actually it's quite tricky to find talent and, and I think that's uh, particularly because we're because we're not because the principal amount of work is happening in the UK it's there's there's smaller chunks happening in China so finding talent who are available for a smaller um, contract essentially is is more difficult um, and and also i think for our, our animation um, service providers in the uk it's it's harder we understand it's harder for them you know to because they can't hand pick the talent in quite the same way that the way that they would do uh, in in the uk so so there's a bit of a challenge around finding the right talent i think so i, I think the the answer to that is kind of building some flexibility into our our, our um, schedule and our, our pipelines to try and to try and just decide we, what work sits where you know, as and when we know who's available to, to do it. And I, th- I think uh, what we've found um, is that the quality of work though uh, is extremely high, uh, but it's really availability that that's the bit that needs to be considered when we're, when we're planning um, the, these projects uh, and having that kind of flexibility. Um, I think it's um, it's still quite early days in terms of Chinese co-production, um, but you know, but there's only a sort of handful of projects that that, that have that, that have successfully come through this sort of process, and I, and I think um, what we what we found is that the amount of work that needs to happen in China can sometimes be open to interpretation. So again, it's it that and, and that 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 comes to light through conversations a bit more and actually having just that little bit of flexibility uh, so you can you can provide what the um, partners need as, as well as our needs um, through that flexibility is, 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 is uh, how we've managed uh, on, on both those projects to get them to work quite smoothly. Um, we, we've noticed and I think this is this is not just unique to China but uh, co-production in any any territory there's inevitably some duplication in um, roles and facilities so your budget can go up in certain areas, um, and and actually with, with China, we'd we'd hope that this would be mitigated by either slightly lower costs or, or uh, but we we've actually found that the costs in China tend to be on on par with the UK or, or on, on depending on the work sometimes a little bit higher. So uh, that's just something to kind of keep in mind. Really, um, it's it's quite a del- delicate balance keeping the spend in the right places. So, um, you know, so you you're hitting their 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 criteria for localization and, and hitting our our, our criteria area as well so yeah it's, it's all about it's all about balance but but going back to to the point that that I made earlier and, and, and both Colin and Alan have made the, 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 these are really good partners and they are they're easy partners to talk to and, and actually if you hit some issues or problems or uh, that you that you need to resolve that they're, they're really receptive that's fantastic there's so much more I wish we were doing a full a full workshop I'd like to bring Alicia in because she has a different lens on the subject and I think um, Alicia over to you to ask some questions of the panel (laughs) as we bring everybody together. Thank you. Um, I think on a personal level I'm fascinated. There's just so much I want to ask and and I feel like Alan, Colin and Antonia might call you individually after the session. Um, I feel like I just keep nodding what you said Um, and I I do pick up I think from a uh, Chinese perspective that um, Colin, when you mentioned comic, you know that's something I think in almost like in China, especially so, um, people are uh, you know life is the speed of life is incredibly fast, so people want something really quick and make people laugh and then move on. Um, so I'm I'm looking forward, you know, when you create that series. I know Alec T. Smith is a great writer, and in fact we we've done. Um, a deal that his uh, Claude book uh, just published in China actually uh, this April. So yes, yeah, sounds sounds great. And Alan, you mentioned trust. Um, well, I think with China, it's probably you know one of the most important word people want to trust you before they um, want to do any business. I think really. Um, and Tony, you you mentioned that kind of the two project. I think both Laugh Monster is. 
maybe this whole p- pandemic, you know, is kind of talking about kids' emotions and it's it's like a new thing, I think, really taking off in China as well. You know, mindfulness and that kind of toddler's tantrum, I think, has always been something that um, in the West people talk about. But in China, you know, they don't even, they haven't even heard about this terrible tool concept. So it's all quite new. Um, and you said adding into the Chinese elements, the mooncake, you know, the kind of culture-specific festival and that would definitely be a great hit in China, I can imagine. Um, but for now, I, I want to obviously keep it brief for the panelists and for the audience watching the discussion. Um, I think all the three case studies shows that co-production can be done incredibly well. And as someone works across cultures, I think from a, a Chinese perspective, I also know the challenge. You know, it's, it's not that straightforward. I, I can give you a, a personal example that we, we have recently successfully broke a deal between Hachette Children's Group to partner with Citic Press in China, who are actually the publisher for Love Monsters and also Alec T. Smith's book in China, um, to co-produce a, a popular you know, science, popular science series called Science Pop. It's going to be a series of 150 titles aimed at children between age 5 to 12, and it's going to be co-published together in the next five years. Um, but I have to say, you know, it, it's not been an easy journey. We've started conversation back in 2019, luckily before the pandemic. We all gathered physically together in Beijing, um, you know, kind of to start this drawing board, do some brainstorming ideas and has been hard working through the pandemic in the past 18 months and with a different time zone. I think the hardest, the different working speed in so many lockdowns, it's like one country coming out from lockdown, the other country just entering into lockdown. Um, I'm glad finally achieved a good result, like all your production um, projects that are taking off. Um, and I know lots of people watching this video would also be interested in working with China and to kind of really build that kind of trust trust uh, relationships. Um, so I'm just ask start with a very gene- generic question that if you could name one thing that you think you do to, to make this China-UK co-pro a success, um, what do you think from your personal experience the, is the secret sauce, really? Um, maybe we start with, um, I don't know, Colin. I suppose it's 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 probably just re- 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 reiterating what you know we said before. For for us, the universal language is com- is comedy, but in terms of relationships, um, it's it's just that, re- it's it's that respect, it's that mutual respect, um, mm-hmm. as as partners. And I think I think that, you know, respect and trust, um, and that's that's also a universal thing with any partners, any two partners, in any two parts of the world, you know, whether they're culturally um the same or, 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 or not. Um I think for us that's the that's the secret sauce. Secret sauce to all of our relationships actually to be perfectly honest. And that this one's no exception. Yeah. I guess make people laugh, you know, like kids kids want yeah, laugh and so does that out and yeah. Definitely. Um what what do you think, Alan? And you yeah, also work I mean, more in depth as a writer. Like it's a different relationship as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I've got three kids at various ages, sixteen, twelve, and uh, six now, um, and it's. Um, I always have them at the back of my mind. I always have, you know. I always remember my son when he was watching preschool, and I always just think, would he relate to this episode? Would he laugh? You know, would my daughters laugh in the same way? Um, you know, what is it that interests them, you know, and often it's just daft things that kids like, you know, really silly things that kids love. Um, and that does seem to be a universal thing. You know, I'm a huge fan of, you know, silent movies, Buster Keaton and, uh, you know, Harold Lloyd and so on. Um, and just that, you know, any kind of visual comedy storytelling really interests me. And, and that really does work, you know, uh, across the world uh, because you're telling a story without telling a story. Um, and uh, as lo- kids love that as well. Kids love it when they get a joke. Um, I mean, they're surprisingly sophisticated at, at you know at knowing what's funny. Uh, you know, kids are very sophisticated. Uh, you know, they get when you know they get embarrassment, for instance. You know, you get when a car- character's 
frightened, you know, but in a, in a funny way. Um, they love that kind of stuff. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's using all those sort of universal uh, storytelling, uh, you know, sort of uh, tropes, which um, you can just imagine, you know, would a kid uh, be entertained by this? You know, is a kid going to love this? You know, really funny uh, moment. Um, and then going from there, really, and, you know, hoping that they do love it. Yeah. And do you find it kind of challenging sometimes to get into kind of like a deep dive brainstorming conversation with partners in China because we we can't physically travel and meet people in person that just, you know, sort of screen? Do you do video calls with, with people in China? Yeah, well, I do do video calls. I tell you what I do do sometimes is I've been known to draw certain things because I'm a cartoonist as well. Mm-hmm. And um, sometimes that can help particularly in explaining something visually uh, uh, to, you know, to a sort of team of, you know, um, executives or whatever. Um, If you just draw a visual image, uh, it can really help um, uh, rather than just words because, you know, obviously everything that we write has to be translated and then the notes have to be translated back. So um, sometimes, like they always say, you know, a picture tells a thousand words and um, it's really true. You know, if I just draw the weird idea that I've come up with, you know, it can save a save an awful lot of time and everybody gets it straight away. Yeah, that's a great idea, yeah. Um, what, what do you think, Tony, and obviously, you know, BBC is a different scale, um, operating a global team and, and taking that kind of creative feedback and absorb, like you said, to kind of start at the beginning. Yeah, we are. I think, I mean, just thinking about your sort of what's the secret sauce, and I, I think it doesn't matter how, how big you are, I think it's about the personal connections with the with the partners that you're working with. And I was really interested to hear your, what, when you're talking about your sort of visiting Beijing, and, and I think that's something we, we haven't been able to do, obviously, because of the, because of the, the pandemic. Uh, but I, I worked on... Um, uh, a show with Sesame a few years ago. We we joked at the time that that a three day trip to New York, we were able to achieve more in that three days than we could have done in three months on email, and I, and I think that's sort of a similar situation with with this, and that we've been doing these productions through this sort of unprecedented times where we haven't actually really been able to meet the people. But what what I think has helped us is the fact that we we haven't just immediately started these relationships and these connections we've we've known ching for a little while now we've met i've met her in person a few times uh, at, at the markets uh, and actually building up that that those kind of personal connections previous to to actually going to production has been really helpful particularly at this time but and and, and zoom you know despite it we're not in the same room as each other. We are. You can still have some really good uh, connections with your with your partners uh, across across Zoom. I find, and actually having making sure that we have those regular catch ups and moments and, and opportunities for everyone to sort of be in a room, even though it be a, a Zoom room, is, is really important to the production. And and I think that puts you in really good stead for for the practicalities as well as the the creative side of things. If you've got those good connections, so that I, I think that's uh, you know with with um, particularly with, with with both projects, but just to talk about um, uh, Supertato, we, BBC Studios also have their Beijing office and actually having a team on the floor there has really helped us out, having, again, having been able to have those face-to-face meetings and have those um, have a team actually on the floor there has been really helpful for, for us. And so that would be my advice, I think. The more, more personal connections you can get, the better. Mm, yeah, I presume you are, you are on WeChat. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's always my top tip to everybody. Make sure your WeChat's working. <laughs> yeah. So you need to download the Chinese TikTok. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap it there. And thank you so much. I think our industry really does work on the adage, yeah, know, like and trust the people that you're working with. If you can get that and then you can have a laugh when things are going wrong as well as when you're creating amazing content, that's when we lift the content and the editorial up because we're not worrying about other matters and we can really focus in on the nuances and the and the timings and everything that goes into making an amazing show. So without further ado, thank you, you know, Alan, Tony, Colin and Alicia for coming and I hope that we can all continue our journey on creating more content that gets out to more eyeballs around the world so thank you thank you, thank you. thanks